tonight. But uh, please remember our July goal of soccer ball funds for Operation Christmas Child. We want to purchase 700 soccer balls and pumps. That's at a cost of just over $3,000. And uh, you can give to that fund, just market OCC soccer balls. And we're going to trust the Lord for what he is going to supply for us. We think of these special prayer requests today, folks recovering from surgeries. Please remember Rex Boffman, who will be having surgery on the 8th, and uh, lift Rex and his family up in prayer as he has his surgery. This week, you see the other needs that are there as well. well. This week's our prayer meeting on Wednesday. Looking ahead, next Sunday, Lord weather, Lord weather, Lord willing and weather permitting. <clears throat> we'll try and get that out. We're going to have a baptismal service and also a picnic following our morning worship service. It's going to be a great Sunday because we'll be observing the Lord's table, one of the ordinances of the church, and then also having a baptismal service. It's going to be a very, very special Sunday, and I want to encourage you to plan to come. If you can sign up out in the foyer, that will give us an idea of how many folks are planning to be here for the picnic next Sunday morning. Bring a couple dishes to pass. We'll put it all together. Uh, we're going to have some lunch meat trays as well, and we're just going to have a wonderful, wonderful time of fellowship uh, next Sunday. Also, next Sunday evening is the Curvinsville Vesper service at uh, Irwin Park, 6 o'clock. Bring your lawn chairs, and uh, I, I think Pastor Scott is preaching this year from Faith Bible Church. I want you to save the date at July 25th, 6 o'clock in the evening. Crossover will be in concert that Sunday evening. Help me out. Invite your friends to come with you to this concert as they come and share the gospel message in songs, and it's going to be a wonderful evening. And then July 26th to the 30th is our five-day clubs with Child Evangelism Fellowship. And uh, make sure that you pick up a, a flyer out in the foyer and take it for your children or take it to invite the neighborhood children your grandkids, make sure we have a lot of children here that week. And then uh, in August, we're going to the Curve as a church family again. And that information is on the screen. There's a, there's a signed-up sheet out in the foyer. If you have any questions, see Carla. She'll be happy to answer them for you. I know this is early, but please, please, please begin praying for our fall revival meetings in the month of October with our friend Dr. Wendell Collier. I'd like to invite you to stand with me this morning as we begin our time together, focusing not on the announcements now, but focusing on God's Word. Let's read together from the book of Galatians. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray together this morning. Loving Father, we thank you that we can worship you on this very, very special day. I thank you for each and every home that is represented. I thank you for each one that has made a special effort to come and gather together and worship you. And Father, we know as a nation, we have many, many needs. We lift up our president, our vice president, all elected officials. We lift up our nation in prayer today. It seems like we are moving rapidly in a downward slide away from biblical truths, biblical principles, biblical ideals. And Father, it breaks our hearts to see what is happening to the country that we love. And so we pray, Father, as we begin this service, that there might be a revival in our nation. We would even be so bold as to pray that the revival would start with us. Give us a passion, Father, to live 100% for you to be bold to share our faith. And Father, we, we humbly cry out that you would save our nation and save our country. We ask your blessings upon this service.
And all of God's people said, Amen. You notice the flags that are here this morning, and we always do this on the 4th of July. We don't have junior church today, but uh, we have the flags for all of our children and teens. And after the service, before you leave, just come up and, and take home an American flag. We are proud of our flag. And Brother Bob's going to come. Happy to see Bob and Eileen. Pastor Bob and Eileen back. They have had a, a week at Child Evangelism Fellowship training and then a week at Little Mahoney Bible Camp last week. And they're still upright. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's great for old geezers, okay? And so, Bob, come and lead us. And our praise team, if you'll come on the platform now and be all ready after we sing these two songs. Yeah, someone said to me this morning, wow, you're in church with older people. <laughs> <clears throat> Good to see you all this morning. Good to be back singing, so we're carrying it over. I think any day is a great day to worship and sing about our good, good Father.
lives and able to find a home and make that little, uh, get things ready to purchase it, and we're happy for you. When you look at the screen this morning, you see the title of the message, and you also see it in your, in your handout. If America Forgets God. As we gather on the 4th of July, 2021, let me say at the very beginning two things that I want to share with you. First, I'm eternally grateful that I am a Christian. How thankful I am for the day, 65 plus years ago, as a 10-year-old boy, that I realized I was a sinner and trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I love the old hymn and used to sing it with my associate pastor, Jim Kester, in Oxford, Michigan. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went into the keeper and settled long ago, long ago long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago. Well, if you're here this morning and you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, the old account was settled, and it was settled long ago. The second thing that I want to share with you this morning is I'm not only eternally grateful that I'm a Christian, I am extremely grateful that I'm an American. My parents were missionaries in Panama. And when it come time for Dan to make his entrance, they hustled over to the Panama Canal Zone so that I could be born at Margarita Hospital in the Canal Zone, which means that I am an American citizen. And I'm so thankful that they had the wisdom to do that so that I can be a citizen of the United States of America. I confess this morning that I have no tolerance I have no sympathy with those who are always speaking ill of our country. I have no sympathy for those who are tearing down our country or our military and acting like America is the villain rather than the victim, the promoter of evil rather than the protector of good. Can I just remind you of these words this morning? And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died. We have a whole generation of people who have forgot the men that died. And I won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me. And I'll gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Because there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. I love our country. I'm proud that I'm an American. But that is not to say that I am happy and comfortable with everything that is still going on in our country. There is much about America that really, really disturbs me. There is much that I see happening in our nation that concerns me as an American. My greatest concern is how God is being forgotten in and by our nation. Not only is God being forgotten, but God is being pushed out of our nation's public life. And any mention of God is scorned and ridiculed. I remember a few years ago, we had a president that said this. 
we, whatever we once were, we're no longer a Christian nation. At least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, and a nation of what? Non-believers. What is tragic about that statement is that it is true. And that people like him that said it and the liberal left of this country really want it to be that way. Today, the liberal left are doing their best to revise history and remove any trace of God in the American story. But an honest approach to our history will reveal that our nation, the United States of America, was founded as a religious country. In 1892, just as David Brewer said, this is a religious people. This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is a single voice making this affirmation. We find everywhere a clear recognition of the same truth. These and many other matters which might be noticed at a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterance that this is a Christian nation." End of quote. In 1954, Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote, I believe no one can read the history of our country without really realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding genius. Whether we look to the first charter of Virginia, or to the charter of New England, or to the charter of Massachusetts, or to the fundamental orders of Connecticut, the same objective is present, a Christian land governed by Christian principles." End of quote. If you were an absolute stranger to our country, and to the history of America. If you were to go to our capital in Washington, D.C., if you would stroll through the federal buildings, you would come away with a belief that this nation was a Christian nation. You would find, for example, in the rotunda of the Library of Congress, Moses, a statue of Moses and the Ten Commandments. If you were to go through the Supreme Court building, you'd find Moses holding the Ten Commandments. If you would walk through the National Archives, there is a bronze medallion in the floor that contains the Ten Commandments. In the chapel of the U.S. Capitol building, there is a prayer room. Yes, a prayer room. And in that prayer room is a stained glass of George Washington and is on his knees in prayer with the words of Psalm 16, 1, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Now these are only a few examples of the many references to God in the Bible that are found in the buildings of our nation's capital. But do they mean much today? Sadly, I personally don't think so. I think that we as a nation today have largely forgotten God. That's why I've asked this question. If America forgets God, what does it mean? I want to invite you to take your Bibles with me this morning. And I've got my Bible that I always use on the 4th of July. My red, white, and blue Bible. 
And I want you to open to Psalm 9. Psalm 9. Because here, I want us to think first of all this morning about the prosperity of a nation that follows God. And we're going to look here at the first ten verses of Psalm 9. If you need a Bible, there's probably one under the seat ahead of you, or maybe one you're sitting on. But it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have set on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne of, for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in the times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. What a passage of scripture. The psalmist is speaking of a people that seek God. And he basically says in this psalm that people who seek God are a thankful people. You see verse 1, it talks about wonderful deeds. Verse 2, there's praise. Verses 3 through 8 describe why they can give praise. They're thankful for the protecting hand of God that has been so wonderfully demonstrated on their behalf. God has protected the nation of Israel, it says in this verse, from their enemies. The enemy desired their destruction, but God had destroyed the enemies, and God had preserved them. And then they discovered in verse 9, and I love this praise, that the Lord was a refuge for the oppressed. And the Lord was a refuge in a time of trouble. That was a great cause to be thankful for, that God was their refuge. God had watched out for them, and God had watched over them. And then secondly, we see point B, not only are they a thankful people, but they are a trustful people. Verse 10 says that they put their trust in God. They acknowledged him as their protector. They looked to him for guidance. They exemplified a need for God. They declared that they are his people and their faith is in him as their God. God is not someone they talk about, but someone they know and they trust. These people are people that are thankful. They are people who are a trustful people. They trust in God. They had experienced the faithfulness of God. <laughs> Look again at verse 10. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I, I, they were a people that had followed God and trusted in God. And they were a people that had been blessed by God. It's interesting that in Psalm 33, verse 12, blessed is the nation. You know what that's talking about, right? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. A nation that follows God will be a nation that will be blessed 
and a nation that will prosper, we often sing these beautiful words, God bless America. Land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam, God bless America, my home sweet home. You see, this psalm is telling us that God's hand of blessing will be upon any nation that follows him. A nation that has a thankful heart, a nation that trusts in him. I believe that our nation has, for the most part, in the early history of our nation, been obedient to the word of God and followed God. We're living in different days today. I'm so thankful that America is a land of liberty. I'm so thankful America is a land of freedom. I'm so thankful that our countryside is blanketed with churches. I'm so thankful that missionaries have gone out from our shores to tell the rest of the world about the Lord Jesus Christ and how you can go home to heaven when your days are over on earth. When you look at the history of our nation, God has been honored throughout the history. And I believe that the real greatness of America has been because God was honored in the inception of this country and throughout the majority of the history of our nation. I trust you're familiar with this verse. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. That's a powerful verse of Scripture. A nation is not great primarily because it is good, or it's a good nation. A nation is great because it is godly. And when a nation ceases to be godly, that nation will cease. To be a great nation. Let me just move on this morning. Not only do we want to think about the prosperity of a nation that follows God, but we want to think for a moment about the peril of a nation that forgets God. What happens to a nation that forgets God? What will happen to America if America forgets God? Well, the answer is given to us here in Psalm 9, verse 17. The wicked shall return, shield, all the nations that forget God. Do you know the Bible has a lot to say about hell? Do you know that? That word shield, reference there, can be to hell. And when we think of hell, we think of the wicked. What do you mean by the wicked, Dan? We are talking about all those who are lost, all those who did not receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, all those who chose to go their own way. The Bible describes them as lost. They will be turned literally into hell. And we need to notice that hell is not only for individuals, but this is a verse telling us about nations that will end up in hell if you forget God. As I said earlier, the thing that most concerns me about our beloved country is that God is being pushed out of our national life. God is being divorced from all of our public affairs. I want you to consider this question with me this morning as we begin to think about the direction now of a nation. And the direction of a nation is so alarming. And it's speaking here in our text of a nation that forgets God. And the implication is that a nation had at one time recognized and honored God, but now it says God is forgotten. The word 
forgot means that the people have become oblivious to God. At one time they knew God, they followed God, but now they've turned their back on God and they have forgot all about God. What a question is found for us in Psalm 11.3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? As I think of our nation today on the 4th of July of 2021, I've never seen our nation in such a mess as it is today. America is being programmed to forget God. I'm thinking today of our decaying nation. And my heart breaks. I can go back over the last half a century plus. I can take you with me this morning to the Supreme Court. And I want to do that. I want to show you some decisions that were made in the Supreme Court that is the beginning of the decay of the America that I love. I want you to see the court's decisions this morning and then answer the question, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? As far as I understand it, the first decision that caused our nation to begin to decay was made in 1962, Engel versus Vital. The decision removed prayer from public schools. This was the first time that the Supreme Court showed any hostility toward the Christian faith. Now we are a long ways since 1962, and I want to tell you something. Our public schools need more prayer today than they've ever needed. When the Supreme Court in 1962 ruled we could not have prayer in our public schools, do you know what the prayer was that was at the heart of the issue? It was these words. To the Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence on Thee. We ask Thy blessing upon our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. And the Supreme Court said, you can't pray in the public schools anymore. Legally. Some do. Some do. Prayer has practically been outlawed from all public gatherings. In most places, you can't pray before a ball game anymore. In most places, you won't see a coach kneel down with his team or her team and pray. But I guarantee you one thing, if you go to the stock car races, you will. The second decision occurred a year later. June the 17th, 1963. That decision removed Bible reading from public schools. It's interesting, the court said it is unconstitutional. Yet, in 1782, Congress approved the use of the Bible in schools and in 1782, they even paid for Bibles with taxpayer dollars. Interesting, isn't it? In 1844, when someone sued 
to remove the Bible from the public schools. The Supreme Court ruled, why should not the Bible be read and taught as the divine revelation in the school? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly and perfectly as from the New Testament? That changed June 17th, 1963. The third decision was Roe versus Wade. It was filed 1973 in Dallas, Texas. And it legalized the murdering of children in the womb. You say, Dan, you can't say that. I sure can say it, and I just said it. Don't tell me what I can't do. Hang on. Since 1973, more than 62 million babies. Did you hear what I just said? 62 million babies have been aborted, have been murdered, have been butchered in the womb. Two every minute. Can you wrap your mind around that this morning? I prepared this message and I can't wrap my mind around that. If you wonder why our economy is so messed up, remember that if those babies had not been murdered, there would have been between 35 and 70 trillion more dollars fed into the economy. Because those babies were not allowed to live, we can understand why we're having such a terrible time with our economy. No wonder Social Security is in trouble. No wonder Medicare is in a crisis. I'm going to say something and listen carefully. I don't think God sees our nation as a wholesome and a wonderful nation since more than 62 million babies have been aborted. The fourth decision, 1980, Stone versus Graham. This decision is, it is unconstitutional Think about it. It's unconstitutional to post a copy of the Ten Commandments in public schools. The court did not say that it was unconstitutional to memorize the Ten Commandments. They didn't say it was unconstitutional to quote the Ten Commandments. They did not say it was unconstitutional to read the Ten Commandments. They said it was unconstitutional to just post the Ten Commandments in public schools. Do you remember what they are? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covenant. And the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional just to post them in public schools. I don't know if they thought that they were afraid that children would walk by them and read them. After all, if children could walk by and read them and read, Thou shalt not kill, they might think on it. They might believe it. They might obey it. They said, we're not going to allow the Ten Commandments <clears throat> to be posted in our public schools. And God said, Thou shalt not kill. But because the court thought that it did, what it did would be better for our country, 
you and I know this morning, and it breaks my heart to even say it, that many, many children have been murdered and wounded in classrooms and hallways of our public schools. I don't even like to think about it, let alone talk about it. 118 years before that decision, the Supreme Court had said, why not have the Bible, especially the New Testament, without note or comment be read and taught as a divine revelation? Where could the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly and so perfectly than from the Bible? I want to tell you something. They knew something back then. They practiced something back then that is no longer practiced today. By the way, the Constitution has not changed. Amen? But now, the liberals, the secular humanist, the atheist, the socialist have hijacked our country and our system. They hate our Constitution, and they want to do away with it. And if you don't understand that, you better wake up. And you better understand what is happening in America today. You remember the First Amendment? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What's happened? The liberals have come along and said, we're going to make a decision and assert that the amendment means that no one is to endorse Christian words. And friends, that is not what the First Amendment means. Do you remember where we started? God has always blessed a God-fearing nation. God has always had his hand of blessing on those who rise up and bless his name. God has also rejected nations that reject him. Here's the fifth decision. Lawrence versus Texas, June 26, 2003. This fifth Supreme Court decision was a very serious decision. It overturned the Texas anti-sodomy law. Once that decision was made, the other 12 states that had that law had the laws overturned. And you say, Dan, what did that mean? What does that mean? It meant that same sex activity could be legal. Twelve years later, June 26, 2015, just over six years ago, the Supreme Court struck down all state bans on same-sex marriage and legalized it in all 50 states. I don't care what the Supreme Court says about gender, but I do care what my God says about gender. Unfortunately, those five Supreme Court decisions I just gave you are the decisions that has caused America to decay. And now today we are facing so many more issues Open border, woke, critical race theory, defend the police, remove all guns, gender, transgender sports, which if you don't know what that means, it means biological men can now play girl sports. I think I heard on the news this morning that a Miss America contest could even have a transgender from one state participating this year. Think about that. 
Think about that in America. I have to hasten on the destruction of a nation that's awaiting. The psalmist tells us that all nations that forget God will be ultimately hurled into hell. You remember President Ronald Reagan? He said this, and I'm quoting, Without God, there's no virtue, because there's no promoting of the conscience. Without God, there's no coursing of the society. Without God, there's no democracy. It will not endure. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we'll be a, we will be a nation gone under. Psalm 9, verse 16 says, The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. Remember, I have to tell you this morning, I'm your pastor that loves you, and I'm going to stand before the Lord someday, and I'm going to give an account of every message I've ever preached, and I'm going to give an account of this message I'm preaching this morning. God is a God of judgment. You may not like it, but God didn't ask for your opinion. And God is going to judge the wicked. The Bible says God is going to judge wicked nations that forget him. You might be here this morning and you might be thinking, Oh, Dan, if we can just get Biden out of the White House, everything's going to be great again. Listen carefully to me this morning. Our need is not getting Biden out. It's getting God back in. If we don't get God back in, America is headed for judgment. Quickly, let me just give you that third point of my message. And yes, I know what time it is. The prayer for a nation that fears God. 19 and 20. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that you are but men. What's the psalmist praying for? He's praying that the nation, his nation would once again fear God. He talks about the exaltation of the power of God. He says, arise, O God. He's praying that God would show himself a powerful God. And that God would send what we would call today a revival. And I believe this morning as your pastor that the only hope we have for America is revival. The humiliation of the pride of man. Verse 20 says, Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. When you look at this verse, I have to tell you, America is a proud nation. America is an arrogant nation. America is a nation who acts like it does not need God. But man is nothing apart from God. Why does man think like that? Because today, our problem is, we think we are gods. We do not think we need God. And friends, we need to be praying every day for revival, that God would send revival to America. That's my prayer. That's the prayer we need to pray. Why? Because the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ will still change lives today. And you have to decide, am I going to totally give myself to the Lord and allow God to use me the way he might want to use me? You're going to have to decide, if I do this, you're going to have to come to the conviction that God has a plan for your life. And God has a plan, and he wants to use you for his honor and glory. And God is not done with you. You say, oh, Dan, you don't know what I've done. I've messed up my life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I got a God that's bigger than any mess you've ever made. And all he wants you to do is cry out to him and say, Lord, I've messed up my life, but I'm turning to you today. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Bible tells us the righteous can stand. 
Friend, you need to be standing up for the Lord. Somebody I was around yesterday said, I thought they said, oh my God. And I said, hey, you don't have to call me God. I use that line all the time. Oh, they said, I didn't say God. I said, gosh. Stand up. The righteous can be salt. And the righteous can share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with everyone we come in contact with. I have one more slide. I almost don't want to put it up. Because it's so powerful. We are one generation or less away from losing our country. Loving Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for Psalm 9, such a powerful passage of scripture. It speaks to our hearts. We know that everything that we've just studied this morning is accurate and it's true. We have not embellished anything. We know, Father, the seriousness, oh, the seriousness of this day and age. We know, Father, what's happening to the country we love. Every day, we say, I can't believe that's happening. Father, I pray. I pray that God's people would get serious. I pray that God's people would cry out, humble themselves. Your word tells us if my people will pray and turn from their wicked ways, You've said you will hear from heaven. And Father, we need a heaven-sent revival to turn our nation, the nation that we love, back to you. And Father, even as I pray that, and I know we're supposed to pray in faith believing, but we look at everything we've looked at this morning, these five major decisions, and, and we have to be honest and say, oh, Lord, Maybe you're just going to take your hand of blessing off America. For America's turned her back on you. Father, I don't know. But I do know that you've told us that we have not because we ask not. So we just come asking today. Asking, Father, that if it would please you, that you'd send a revival. And just turn our nation back to you today. And all God's people said. Amen. We're closing our service this morning with a very familiar short little hymn. It says, if my people will pray. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to sing these words prayerfully today. Prayerfully today. And as we sing them, think of the words, pray for our country. Pray for our nation. Pastor Bob's then going to close our service in prayer today. Let's sing it together. If my people.
Father, this morning we have been reminded of our history. And Lord, again, we've been reminded that we were a nation founded on biblical principles, founded on the word of God. And then we have watched as our nation has slowly began to push God out of the forefront, out of the people's eyes. And then, Lord, they stand with their hands in the air and say, we don't understand. Father, our nation is in deep trouble. And Father, we come to you this morning, to you, our Lord, our Savior, Lord, the one whose name was used in the foundation of this nation. Father, we just thank you for the way you have blessed this nation. But Lord, we just pray for the elected officials in Washington, for those that sit in the Supreme Court, that, Lord, they would go back and reread the history of this nation and realize its foundations, and the foundations are crumbling. And Father, we just beg for revival in the land of America. Father, we thank you for the time we could be here together in your house this Lord's day. Lord, we just pray your blessing on each one for having been here, for our pastor as he has preached the truth of the word of God again to us this day. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 